Hello and welcome. I'm happy to be here with John Michael McDonough. He's the director of The Forgiven. Uh, it's a film that's just world premiered here at TIFF in our gala program. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Diana. So I have quite a few questions about The Forgiven that I'd love to you know, explore some of the, the themes uh, that, you, that you portray in, in the film. And I wanted to begin with um, you know, talking about this, this is a no, um, an adaptation from a novel. And I want, was curious how you came to the project. I think the novel was published in 2012, which is a fair amount of time ago now. Since it was published, Lawrence Osborne has gone on to become a little bit more famous, I guess. Uh, I think virtually every book he's written since has been optioned. Uh, but we're the first one to actually get filmed. I knew somebody had had the option for a few years and I didn't know what was going on with it because nothing seemed to happen with it. So I wrote Lawrence a letter and he basically said he wasn't happy with what was going on. So basically the next time it came up, we outbid the other person and took it on. Um, and at that point, things moved quite quickly because I write quite quickly. So I think the first draft was just a couple of weeks and then another week for revisions and we sent it out to Ray Fiennes and within a week he said yes. Of course, you know, scheduling with that was, uh, schedules and everything then kind of stalled uh, the project for a little bit, but it was still quite a fast process. Um, so we got, I think we got up and running from option in the book, writing the screenplay, getting Ray involved, scouting locations and everything, within about two years, which is quite fast usually for that kind of project. Um, and yeah, and as I said, since then, Lawrence's, uh, Lawrence's fame has increased a lot. So we're quite happy that we got it quite early. And what attract, like, what attracted you the, to the story? The, is it the theme of randomness? What was it? Was there parts of that? Cause I find it a very interesting story of like, um, you know, expats or foreigners in, you know, within this Moroccan landscape. And it's almost like the foreigners themselves are the exoticized um, rather than than the locals. It's a, the, the gaze is kind of switched. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how your approach was and what the what you, what you wanted to portray. Uh, well, I think the main thing in the book was that you had this uh, great visual aspect, um, which is what you're talking about. It's kind of the production design, costume design, these people are very glamorous and they're in the middle of nowhere in the desert. So it lends itself to a whole visual aspect. But also it has the book itself, and obviously I try to add a lot to this, had that kind of, has a lot of unsympathetic characters, so it has a lot of that kind of Harold Pinter type dialogue, kind of sarcastic and nasty. And, you know, going back to what um, drew me to the book was I, I, I'm a big reader of uh, literary crime thrillers. So I'm always looking for that kind of a story that I guess they used to do it in European cinema and American cinema in the 60s, 70s. But I don't feel you see it as much uh, anymore. And, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it's the glamorous nature of the guests at the villa is then counterpointed with the Berbers showing up and basically taking over the plot. And then obviously the plot bifurcates. So we get uh, Ray from the Berbers in the desert and we get Jessica at the party. So I like that in the book and in the film, the fact that we're continually going back and forth, two different storylines. And obviously the what you want to do is you want to make both stories feel as strong. So I think sometimes reading the book uh joe's story got lost a little bit so it was joe is the character played by jessica so it was about making them both have e equal weight um and it was i guess in a pretentious way it was that kind of it's kind of an existentialist thriller or drama in a way about what happens to these people uh, and it also had there's the whole kind of comic element, as you said, that is this all these rich people um, having a jolly old time in the middle of the desert and in the middle of you know quite a lot of poverty and everything. So it was I felt like the the sort of political political aspects of of the book and of the film are subtext. 
I don't feel like you you had to really verbalize them. It was all kind of there anyway, under the surface. So, because I'm not a big fan of these sort of agitprop films where characters expostulate their political uh, feelings or ideas and you know what the director feels about everything. I, I feel like you should have the story first and everything should be underneath that. No, it, there's a lot of subtext in the film and there's a lot of layers and I, I like how they, they emerge. Um, yeah, in this very, very su subtle way. One of the things that, you know, when you read uh, about the book and the film, it talks a lot about the randomness of the event. Was the, the randomness something that w was important to you to to portray? Like, was it important to the story? Well, I think that's a big element of film noir, isn't it? The way yeah. a random event destroys people's lives. Uh, now, obviously, this isn't kind of a noir in the way it looks, but I've always been a big admirer of those types of films. So I guess that, again, was an another element. And that ex existentialist sort of feeling that things can spiral out of your control and there's not a lot you can do about it other than to behave well, which certain characters do by the end and certain characters don't, you know. So, yeah, it was that, all those kinds of elements. I think it's a film that the more times I see, I, I see more things in it you know, than even I was expecting when I first wrote it and shot it, you know. And, and you did shoot it, you, you shot it in Morocco, and I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think, it, I think did you shoot, like, uh, during COVID? Did, did that affect Yeah, well, what happened was, well, one of the things, again, about the story is I like going on location, right. you know. Um, my first two films are in Ireland. Third one was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I like all that, getting out of my own, you know, room in South London or what have you. Um, so that was a big element for me of why I wanted to make the film. Yeah, we shot in the in the desert, so there's no green screen or anything. We're we're actually there, and we shot. I think we we had a weeks left uh, of shooting before the pandemic happened, and we were basically, you know, put on a chartered plane and flown out. And then we went back in November and did the last week. And it's strange because we edited the film the first four weeks that we'd shot. And what we hadn't edited was the final week, which was uh, Rafe's journey into the desert, which is, back, you know, there's a, there's a massive weight to that part of the story. And it was in the, we did it in the last five days when we went back, when we got the all clear. So it was, it was a strange situation because we'd edited the film uh, between those two periods, but obviously there was such a massive weight of material still left that we were just desperate to get back. So it was great when we got the all clear and you know did it. And then you know we we left where the party was was kind of it was in Erfurt, which was a nice little town and everything. But with you know with Rafe and Ishmael Kanata, who plays Abdella, we were actually going right out into really into the middle of nowhere at that point, which was quite you know it's quite interesting. I like all that part of filmmaking. Yeah, it's very expansive, the desert. Like, it really comes across. It feels, yeah, you can really, uh, feel, it's palpable as you're watching it. I think, see, that's the thing. I think it, it, it does feel that way. And But then when you come back to uh, Jessica Chastain and Chris Rabbit, you're still you're still trying to make that as sort of, as sort of glamorous in its own way, which obviously then gives weight to her story because you have all this glamour and you've got, you know, people around her. Um, the Hamid, the, uh, as he's called, the servant uh, by David, who's observing all of these things. And see, it, there's also, you know, there's a class element as well. That's another subtext to the film. It may not be immediately apparent, apparent but it, it's all there, you know, without yeah. having failed out or anything. I mean, there's, you know, there's little moments where Hamid chucks a whole plate full of wasted food into a bin and stuff like that, but it's a thrown away moment. It's not meant to be a, a big sort of Ken Loach statement or anything, but all these little touches are all there. Yeah, no, it's interesting how you juxtapose those two, I mean, I'd say journeys, very different journeys, uh, Joe's and uh, Ray Fine's characters. Um, that theme of redemp like that theme of redemption or, uh, you know, atonement, was that like, was that, that his character comes to or, just almost like at the end, there's almost like an understanding that like this is the way things must end. Um, yeah, I mean, there is that existentialist element. I had a, a film I did, my second film, Calvary, which has a similar type of feeling to, uh, to it. 
Um, it's, I think what's interesting about the film is that w when it starts, obviously this is a, a marriage that's in disarray between um, Jessica and Rafe's character. The marriage is basically over at this point. And Rafe's character is, in a kind of cliched way, he's obviously uh, not very nice, and we kind of sympathise with Jessica. But, obviously, but during the course of the film, things start to change. And it's Rafe's character who, despite all of his sort of obnoxious witticisms and everything, and his initial lack of empathy, he's the character who actually deals with what they've done. And her character doesn't, which hopefully the audience isn't expecting. Um, and in a strange way at the end, I guess, maybe in a Catholic way, he redeems himself by dying and she doesn't. So, you know, it's kind of, I guess it's a bleak ending, but not for that, not for the David Henninger character, because in Catholic terms, he's saved himself. Uh, whereas she has to live on with everything that they have done, you know. So again, there's, you know, there's a lot of things going on there, you know. One of my favorite cuts in the film is uh, when Jessica says in a close up, that's all in the past. And we cut to Ishmael Kanata Can Abdella at the son's grave in a big wide shot and he's sobbing. Because obviously it's not in the past. Um, and again, you know, things that have happened throughout history are not in the past. They're still present with us now, you know, as we've seen in the last few days in Afghanistan or wherever. So, the, you know, all those, I think that's what I realized when I read the book initially, that there were so many elements to it that if you just got it right, it would be, you know, very powerful visual. And, you know, also the dialogue, you know, Lawrence's dialogue is pretty good and there was that pinter element to it. But I knew I could expand upon it in all the scenes. No, the dialogue is very, um, can be very cutting at times, uh, the, the, the banter. Did you, yeah, did you work on that quite a lot? Did you have, how did you approach that? Well, it's, it's something I've done before and have been known for doing before. Uh, I knew that in the scenes, Lawrence, ba basically, I'd say every scene in the film is there in the book, but I expanded on what Lawrence had set there. So, you know, David has caustic things to say about all the writers who came to North Africa, that, that kind of stuff. The banter between um, Jessica and Christopher Abbott around the breakfast table, the initial parts of that were there, but then it was expanded upon. Um, I, I guess I find it quite easy to write dialogue for nasty characters, you know. And so Lawrence gave me quite a lot to work with, um, and I just ran with it, I guess. Yeah, I know. It really, it really works. The dialogue, it's just, it's wonderful. It's um, um, ter what's terrible and wonderful, you know. <laughs> yeah, and what's interesting is that, um, you know, um, Saeed Tamui's character, Anwar, has a lot of, pretty good dialogue as well but one of the most powerful characters is Abdella who's very precise with everything he says he has the one long story he says when he's face to face with Rafe uh, midway through the film but mostly his character there's a lot of looks you know the other character I really like is Hamid uh, who's kind of the maitre d who has all these gnomic sort of sayings that's then paid off in a joke at the end and I like the way that, you know, we're all continually cutting back and forth to him as he's watching everybody, you know, at the party. And he, in a way, I guess, becomes the conscience of the film in a, in a certain sort of way. I think, the other, you know, again, as I'm talking about it, the other element I liked was that the, when the Berbers show up, they basically take hold of the plot and drive it in another direction. You know, they, they become the narrative force, which is kind of unusual. It's usually Western characters who are the narrative force who drive the story forward. So again, that was another that was another piece of the, the puzzle. Why, why does he go with them? Like that was one piece that I was really wondering. Um, well, it's he has the there's a little bit where he's at the window and uh, Saeed's character and Anwar says to him, "Why did you come here, David?" And he says, "I wanted to cross the bridge and have done with things." So there's a sort of suicidal aspect to David's personality which I think is evident in some of the very kind of confrontational things he said, as he says throughout the film, almost as if he wants somebody to beat him up or something. And also it's the fact that it, I think we, it seems quite clear from the start of the film that he knows his marriage is over. So that's one thing. 
Then he has the throwaway comment about um, a, a woman, he misdiagnosed her and that she had inoperable cancer. So he's dwelling on that. Um, it's clearly he's an alcoholic as well. Yeah. So, and then there's the suicidal thing. I think the other thing though, it may not be as apparent until the end is that although he doesn't show that he feels guilt, he does, and he kind of does want to pay for it, which obviously becomes clear in the final scene. I also, I had a question about the young boys um, that were selling the fossils at the beginning, because you see them with a gun, and you and you're you're not you're wondering about their intentions. Was that purposefully like uh, just not so clear at that moment? Well, see, this is what I found interesting about Lawrence's book is they're not innocents either. Right. They, you know, uh, David Henninger is right when he makes the joke about them, they could have been about to carjack us. They actually were going to carjack them. So, you know, that undercuts them as well. Not that they deserve to die or anything. Um, but, yeah, that was, it was their intention to stop the car and drag them out, get, the, get money, and then steal the car. That was basically the thing. Uh, it's interesting, it's funny though, because in my um, contacts with Lawrence Osborne, um, you know, authors I've found often forget or I wouldn't say they have plot holes, but they have things, they have oversights in their novels. And in the book, they have the gun at the beginning and then the gun is nowhere to be seen until it turns up right at the end again. But in the book, it mentions that it's Abdella's gun. So I said to Lawrence, wouldn't Abdella ask for his gun back? you know, when he's talking to the boy at the cemetery midway through the film. And he said, yeah, sure, John, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, he had seemed to have forgotten that it wasn't there. The other thing they had had was um, in the book, David and Joe were aware that there was a second boy who was a witness. And I said to Lawrence, but if there's a second, if they know there's a witness, why would they bury the ID? There would be no reason to do that. And he said, do whatever you want, John. So, uh, so at that point, I just stopped uh, basically contacting him and I just uh, followed the prop through, prop through logically, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, they were gonna, they were gonna carjack. The little boy, the younger boy wasn't probably aware of what was gonna happen, or Driss was, you know. And it's obviously Driss who dies and the young boy that has to deal with what Driss tried to do. Right, no, that's very interesting because that, I, I like how it's, you can make your own uh, interpretation of that of that uh, point yeah, as well. I mean, yeah, as much as possible. I'm not trying to be ambiguous or anything. I'm trying to give, have everything be there. But I'm, you know, I'm not. A, I hate that kind of explanatory dialogue where everything is revealed to the audience. You know, it's just you, you just have to pay attention. Yeah, absolutely. Because that that's the the part. I is it just interesting? I'm like, I don't think they're innocent either. But it's it can't go there. And he, like, you just can't have that explained <laughs> by them. He's gone, right? Yeah, and also, you know, the first time we see them, uh, Driss is huffing glue. You know, so exactly. He's not really in his right mind when he's making these decisions either. You know, and that would be interesting. You know, I, 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 to see the film with a full audience, to see if that scene gets a laugh or not, you know, because that's not the way you're supposed to introduce characters, you know. So we'll see. No, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. I'm very much looking forward to to have it, showing the film here at TIFF. Um, I really thank you for your time today. It's been very very enlightening. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it because I've only ever seen it with about four or five people. So, you know, this has been the first time for me and it was so great uh, for me to be there to finally watch it with a big crowd and see how they react. Fingers crossed. <laughs> exactly. No, it's going to be it's going to be great. Well, I look forward to seeing you soon in person, I hope. Um, okay. And, and, uh, and thanks for, for chatting with with me today.